You're listening to the Greeks Gridiron live with Ethan Harista Dulu. Welcome back, everyone, to another edition of the Greeks Gridiron. I am Ethan Harista Dulu, and hello again to my fellow USFL fans. It's been a little bit since we last talked. I've been very busy the last couple of weeks, but today I bring back one of my favorite series that I ran prior to this USFL season in the spring this week in the USFL, which will allow me to cover and highlight everything that I want to talk regarding the USFL. I was trying to figure out how I wanted to do something like this the last few weeks, and it finally hit me. This was something that worked really well for me prior to the USFL season this past spring, so I thought, why not bring it back, and I can just roll in all my USFL discussion into one big, massive episode each and every single week. So we're going to start things off first with some recapping and highlighting of some USFL players playing in the NFL's preseason this past week. So make sure you comment down below. I want to hear your highlights from the preseason, players you're seeing get signed to the USFL or to the NFL from the USFL. I want to hear all the discussion and talking points that you guys have. So make sure you dive into that comment section. But we'll start with the very first player I'd like to highlight from this past weekend, and that has got to be Browns wide receiver Austin Watkins, who continues to shine after two weeks now in the preseason. He had a really big Hall of Fame game, and he doubled down with another big game this past weekend as well, finishing off the game with six receptions for 71 yards, totaling nearly 12 yards per reception. This is honestly starting to shape up to be kind of something that the Browns I don't think can really ignore. Like I said, two straight games now in the preseason where he's really showing up strong for the Browns. A strong case is being made for even like a wide receiver five or a wide receiver six role right now by Austin Watkins. And like I said, I just don't really think that the Browns can ignore it at this point. They're looking for depth at the wide receiver spot right now. They have a handful of guys behind like their starting three or so. I would say that they have there, maybe even four that you'd consider locks. But I mean, besides like Amari Cooper, Donovan Peoples-Jones, you have like Anthony Schwartz and there's a few other guys as well. I do think there is like a wide receiver spot or two up for grabs and it feels like Watkins might be able to snag one of those roles if he keeps up the performance he's been having so far this preseason. The next person I want to highlight here is going to be defensive end Levi Bell from the Seattle Seahawks. He had himself a really strong game against the Minnesota Vikings this past weekend. He finished off the day with three total tackles. He had a sack, a tackle for loss, and even hit the quarterback three times as well. This was one that when I talked about the signing, it's a tough roster to crack. The Seahawks just have a really deep group of pass rushers, but I will say this. Whether he winds up sticking around as like a fifth pass, pass rusher because I did mention this as well the Seahawks carried about four or five rushers throughout the majority of last season it's a tough group to crack but if you keep performing the way you are Levi Bell either the Seahawks can't ignore it or somebody else in the NFL is going to take notice that's looking for some pass rush depth Levi Bell looked really good this past USFL season and continuing on now looking strong in week one of the preseason Keep an eye on Levi Bell. He's probably going to end up being on an NFL roster come the start of the regular season, whether it's with the Seahawks or someone else. Next person I'm going to talk here, and this one was a little bit of a surprise to me, so I think he does deserve to be highlighted here, and that's going to be wide receiver Caden Davis of the Arizona Cardinals, making a very solid impression this past weekend against Denver with a game-tying touchdown in the fourth quarter to put the game at 10-10. to It was a seven-yard touchdown pass from quarterback Clayton Toon with about five minutes or so to go in the fourth quarter, and ultimately helped rally the Cardinals to a victory here. It wasn't a massive game by any means, but for him to make a couple of catches and one of them being a critical touchdown grab in a moment that in terms of when you look at the scope of game situation, obviously it's preseason, but it is a situation that they're working with here in the preseason for him to come up strong, make a big catch. This is a wide receiver room in the NFL right now that beyond like wide receiver three, and I've talked about this already as well, it's not the deepest group and there's plenty of spots up to grab. He and Davey and Davis are two guys from the USFL battling out for roster spots there and for Caden Davis to step in, come and make a big touchdown catch in a big moment of a preseason game. Keep an eye on him because I didn't expect to be talking about Caden Davis over Davey and Davis uh, by any means. <laughs> next group we're going to look at here, or next guy we're going to look at here, excuse me, is going to be, and I love that we're talking a kicker here, 
and I've got to shout him out. Dallas Cowboys kicker, Brandon Aubrey, winning the kicking job in Dallas as they let go of their other kicker this past week. The Cowboys are no stranger to USFL talent. See All-Pro kick returner Cavante Turpin in USFL Season 1 MVP, Cavante Turpin. He is now the first USFL player this preseason to lock up a starting role with an NFL team. He went one for one for field goal attempts, and he also went two for three on extra points this past weekend. And talk about a statement by the Cowboys and also by the USFL. They can produce legitimate talent who can take over starting roles for teams. Cavante Turpin was an all-pro returner last year, and Brandon Aubrey was absolute nails this past season for the Stallions, so shout to him locking up a starting role. I don't care if it's a kicker or whatever position it may be. If you're locking up a starting role in the NFL coming from the USFL, that speaks volume to the talent and opportunity that the USFL is presenting. Now, those are some guys I wanted to highlight. Next, we're going to talk some big signings that I want to discuss here. Ones that I think are good fits or people that I'm just really interested in seeing now that they're heading to a team in the NFL. And we'll start things off first with one that is probably the best fit, I would argue, out of any USFL signing so far. And if it's not at the top of the list, it's definitely at like number two or three. And that's going to be Stallions running back CJ Marable signing with the New England Patriots on the veteran minimum one year 750K deal. This, again, might be one of the best fits for a USFL signing at this point here. CJ Marable is an all-around running back. He can literally do everything, whether he's running, catching out of the backfield, or maybe even just playing out wide in the slot or something like that. Whatever you need him to do, he can do it. On top of that, he can pass protect during the passing game as a blocker. And for Bill Belichick to see that and go, I want this guy, bring him in, and they go and sign him, he loves do it all running backs, guys that can literally do anything they need in any situation. CJ Marable is, and when I saw this signing, I was like, wow, that's a literal no brainer. CJ Marable is the ideal running back for Bill Belichick in terms of utility and just the amount of ways he can utilize him. Think someone like James White from a handful of seasons ago during his run with the Patriots. Love this signing. I think it makes a lot of sense. So best of luck to CJ Marable. I know they just brought in Ezekiel Elliott, so that makes the running back room a little bit more crowded. But don't be surprised if the Patriots are running maybe four running backs on the roster because it feels like they are going to be a slightly heavier running team with the way they're building up their group. Don't be surprised if CJ Marable is running back three or four on that roster because he was somebody that did not get enough love this past season. I know it caught on towards the end as the Stallions made their run to the championship, but he was somebody that because Mark Thompson and Wes Hills were stealing all the spotlight, didn't get as much love as I felt he deserved, and I'm really excited to see him in New England. Next signing we're looking at here, Panthers linebacker Frank Ginda signing with the Falcons on that same veteran minimum one-year 750K deal. This is the USFL's Defensive Player of the Year from this past season, and he's joining a Falcons team that, quite honestly, could use a little bit of help at linebacker. They lost Foye uh, Aluakon last season during the offseason, I should say, and now on top of that, when you look at the group right now as far as linebacking corps is concerned, you do have Caden Ellis coming in from New Orleans, and beyond that, it's pretty uncertain what they're going to be doing at the linebacker spot. And I really think there's a lot of spots up for grabs, whether it's even just like some starting play or just depth guys in like the second or third linebacker spots. This is one where Frank Ginda, I feel has a legitimate shot to maybe snag a roster spot here. His ability to play the run and drop back in coverage could be a massive plus for Atlanta. And don't be surprised if Frank Genda is sticking around on the Falcons roster once those roster cuts get made at the end of the preseason. This is another one of those fits that I think makes a lot of sense. And another one that as soon as I saw it was like, wow, that is a perfect place for someone like Frank Genda, who has all the talent in the world to wind up landing right now with the amount of help that Falcons could use at the linebacker position. And as considering there's just so much uncertainty around the inside linebacker spot there in Atlanta. The next signing I'm going to discuss here, this one just kind of hurts me more than anything else for the Panthers, and that is going to be quarterback EJ Perry signing with the Texans, same one-year 750K deal. Uh, it, this one, it, again, it hurts for the Panthers, and Panthers fans, I am hurting for you because we saw what EJ Perry did in limited action with the Michigan Panthers. And I know at the end of the season, I was pounding the table for the Panthers to do what they can to keep him 
on the roster going into the next season because there was just so many quarterback issues with the Panthers last season, and it felt like they were good quarterback play away from actually being a contender in the North. So it's unfortunate that they're going to lose him to the Texans, at least currently. However, bright side here, and again, I, I don't want to sit here and say, I want EJ Perry in the USFL. The whole point of the USFL is to give these guys opportunities in the NFL to make some big money for their for themselves, for their families, and for their livelihoods. But Houston did draft CJ Stroud this past offseason during the draft. And behind him, you also have Davis Mills. Now there's rumors that maybe Davis Mills gets traded. So maybe that does open up a spot in the quarterback room for someone like EJ Perry if he does impress during the preseason. But it's not like there's a starting role up for grabs for him. And if Davis Mills doesn't get moved, I don't see why the Texans would move on from him because I think he's a very serviceable backup for this team. For the Panthers' sake, I hope EJ Perry is around for next spring season in the USFL. However, if not, best of luck to EJ Perry in the NFL. But this is one that I feel like definitely stung the Panthers fan base. And I saw some of that on social media here. So I'm hurting with you guys on this one. Disappointed to see him go. Happy for him to get the opportunity. And then finally, my last signing I want to discuss here, I think this is a really interesting one as well, is going to be Breakers cornerback Neville Clark signing with the Pittsburgh Steelers. No contract details yet, but it was brought up uh, yesterday. It was announced by Aaron Wilson. So I'm going to go with the signing is happening very soon, and I'm sure we'll get the contract details as I'm recording this. And as soon as I'm posting it, it'll probably be out. But as of right now, I don't have any details on that. However, Clark... An integral piece to the Breakers, just top of the line, no fly zone pass coverage that they boasted this past season. With 26 tackles, two interceptions, and seven pass breakups, this is a guy who, again, a Steelers team that is dealing with a lot of turnover at the position right now, could maybe find himself in like cornerback five or cornerback six roles, depending on how things shake out. This entire secondary is pretty much getting a complete makeover here. You have Levi Wallace from last season, but you saw decent amount of players leave as far as the cornerback spot's concerned, and then you bring in second round pick Joey Porter from the draft. You also got Chandon Sullivan and Patrick Peterson from Minnesota as well. There's a lot of turnover in the secondary, especially at the corner cornerback spot and don't be too shocked again somebody who played really well this past season in a really dominant pass coverage group as well don't be surprised if he's cornerback six on the roster the Steelers did carry six last season as well so there is plenty of opportunity with as much turnover going on and uncertainty in that secondary this is another one of those signings that I would not be too shocked if Neville Clark hung on even at like the cornerback six spot for the Pittsburgh Steelers And then finally, to wrap up this week in the USFL, I'll give you guys a little bit of a preview on things that I'm going to be watching going into this weekend slate of NFL preseason games. And with game two of the preseason now kind of turning into like the dress rehearsal game, probably going to see a little bit less of backups and more so maybe like three, I would say you could probably expect anywhere from like two or three drives from a lot of starting units this weekend because that's kind of what's happened with the second game. Because if we were looking at, the preseason prior to them chopping it down to three games. It was like games one and two. You saw a lot of guys just kind of getting opportunity. Game three was dress rehearsal. And then game four was just kind of, all right, let's figure out who we want to try to keep before we make all the roster cuts. So now that we're in that position where there's only three games, game two has kind of become dress rehearsal. So less opportunity this week. I expect to see more in week three of the preseason, but there are some things I'm keeping an eye on. And first and foremost, somebody we talked about earlier, it's got to be wide receiver Austin Watkins. At this point, you're looking at two very dominant games for the Cleveland Browns. I want to see him make it three in a row. This is, I am all in on Austin Watkins and I am rooting for him to make this Browns roster. I think that he has a strong case and a very good opportunity to lock up wide receiver five, maybe force a wide receiver six spot on the roster if his play is just that good. But this is a group that has a hole or two in the wide receiver room right now. And I think Austin Watkins could definitely fill that role. Second thing I'm going to be looking at here, and this is for two players on the San Francisco 49ers here, and that is going to be Breland Speaks and Kiava Tizino, two guys who were dominant this past season in the USFL, but didn't really make much noise against the Broncos last week. So second week opportunity now. We're going to see what they can do, but they only combined for two total tackles. These are two guys that I think make a lot of sense in the 49ers defense in terms of just their skill sets and what they did this past season in the USFL. Uh, I would be a little bit disappointed 
if we're getting just another, maybe a tackle for this guy, tackle for that guy, I want to see some hits. I want to see some stops. I want to see, you know, maybe a big play or two from either one of these guys. Even if it's just as simple as a tackle for loss, maybe a stop at the line of scrimmage, a big hit. I want to see something from one of these two guys because last weekend I was really expecting these two to be some of the like big noise makers and we didn't really get too much out of either of them. So two guys that I want to see on San Francisco make some noise going into week number two. Third thing I'm going to be looking at and that is going to be wide receiver Dion Kane, the 2023 championship MVP. We literally got nothing from him last week. He didn't have a catch. He didn't make a return. Nothing. For somebody who was as electric as he was in that championship game and during like the very back end of that stretch run to the championship, a little bit surprised, especially considering he is somebody who has experience in that system over there in Philadelphia. He's someone that I really felt like, okay, going into this training camp and into the preseason, he could make some legitimate noise. He's sharp. He's coming off of a strong finish to a season in the USFL. And again, he had, he knows the system. He knows what he's getting himself into. The signing made a lot of sense. And the Eagles, very deep team, very tough roster to make. But could I see Deion Kane as like wide receiver five or maybe six on the team? Absolutely. As somebody who has the experience there, why wouldn't he? Especially with how sharp he is right now coming into training camp. However, we didn't get anything from him. So I'm going to be hoping to see some catches from him. I'm not necessarily saying, you know, hit a home run, get a touchdown. But whether it's a strong return or two and punt or kick return, whether it's a catch or two here or there, or maybe just a nice flashy play, I want to see something from Deion Kane. So I'll be keeping an extra sharp, extra sharp eye on the Eagles there just to see what he can do. And then finally, the last thing I'll be watching here, because again, another guy didn't really make a ton of noise last week, but was very good this past season in the USFL. I want to see if all USFL cornerback Mark Gilbert can maybe make some noise in a secondary that is dealing with some injuries right now and could really use someone like him to step up and make a big play or two this weekend to maybe give some consideration to keeping him on this roster going into the regular season. He's going up against an inexperienced Texans team in terms of just quarterbacking with Davis Mills not having a ton of experience in the NFL. And then on top of that, you have a rookie in CJ Stroud who I'm not going to say had a tough week one, but had an up and down week one, I would say, going against the Patriots defense last week. So you got an inexperienced quarterback, pretty young group of wide receivers as well. You could make, you know, you could force an error or maybe capitalize on a mistake made by any of the wide receivers, whether it's a poor route run or maybe just a poor decision made by the quarterback. I think this is a game where if Mark Gilbert's going to make some noise and voice why he should be on this roster, this would be a week for him to do just that on the Dolphins. But that is this week in the USFL from myself. I hope you enjoyed. And if you made it to the end of the video, I greatly appreciate it. Make sure you comment down below your takeaways from last weekend, things you're looking for this weekend. Maybe some of the signings I discussed from USFL players moving their way into the NFL. But that is it for me. I appreciate you. I will see you all next time. Have a good one.